Hello guys, myself Akshay Swami and I'm here to deliver my course. I'll be telling you about brief biography of Samuel Hahnemann. Then we will be learning about the achievements of Hahnemann and Hahnemann's criticism of the practice of his time. A brief biography of Samuel Hahnemann. So let's start with it. Samuel Hahnemann was the third child and eldest son of a pottery painter in the porcelain town of Mission in Saxony. As a child, he showed remarkable aptitude for study, excelling both in languages and in science. He was fluent in English, French, Greek and Latin. Even at the early age of 12, he helped his master to teach Greek to other students. Hahnemann was a pupil of exceptional ability with an exceptional talent for languages. He was drawn irresistibly towards science and research. Let's talk about his student years. It was at Easter in 1775 when he enrolled at the University of Leipzig to study medicine. But he soon became disappointed with its poor facilities as medical students at Leipzig had neither clinic nor hospital at their disposal. While there and to enhance his meager income, he undertook translation work for a fee, such as translating four books from the English and teaching French to a wealthy Greek man in order to help him earn his living. He declined to engage in the social life with other students. Early in 1777, he was transferred as a medical student to Vienna to gain greater clinical experience, though this proved very costly on his paltry allowances. After only nine months and after being robbed, financial hardship forced him to abandon his studentship. However, he had so deeply impressed the physician to the royal court, Professor von Quarin, that he secured for him a second man to practice medicine for a rich patron in Transylvania, who was the governor of Hammerstedt. As family physician and curator of the museum and capacious library. Hahnemann stayed there for 18 months cataloging the governor's coin collection, ancient books and manuscripts, one of the finest collections in Europe of texts on alchemy and magic. While there, he had the opportunity of learning several other necessary languages and of acquiring knowledge of some collateral sciences. Upon leaving Hammerstedt in spring of 1779, he was proficient in Greek, Latin, English and Spanish. Hahnemann submitted a thesis on cramps and registered for the degree of MD at Erlangen in August 1779 after only one term's further study. He chose Erlangen only because he had learned that the fees there would be less. What he did or where he lived during 1779 to 1780 is unknown. But in 1781, he took a village doctor's position in the copper mining area of Mansfield, Saxony. He obtained various medical positions during 1780 to 83. But soon after his marriage, he became increasingly disenchanted with the imperfection of medical practice and turned once again to translation work to enhance his modest income and to feed his growing family. Now, on moving to Dresden in 1784, and by this time, hugely he was dissatisfied with the harmfulness and inefficacy of medicine. He gave up medical practice entirely to devote himself to translation work on a full-time basis. When Hahnemann says, in Dresden, I played no prominent part. He means no prominent part in medicine because he was chiefly a passive translator and scholar and engaged in the raising of his growing family. It was in 1790 
while translating William Cullen's Materia Medica that the first evidence emerged for the great things still to come. Unconvinced by Cullen's theory that synchona was specific for malaria because of its tonic action on the stomach, Hahnemann decided to take a small dose of synchona over several days to observe its effects. In this first proving experiment, Hahnemann observed symptoms broadly similar to those of malaria, including spasms and fever. With synchona, he had produced in himself the symptoms of intermittent fever, which suggested to him a medical principle. He thus established anew the validity of an old therapeutic maxim, like cures like, or similia similibus curenter. Now, in 1796, his essay on a new principle consolidated the work with synchona, extending it into a general principle applicable for all drugs, and this laid the foundation for a complete system of medicine based on similia. By 1796, he was also practicing medicine again, but he did not charge for the medicine which he produced himself. In summary, we can see that the essence he had distilled from his rendering was single drugs in moderate doses, employed for conditions seen when they are proved on healthy volunteers. From this alone, he was inspired to commence a lot of writing of his own. Now, he stay in Turkau. In 1804, with this restless inclination for traveling, finally expanded he settled in Turgau for seven whole years, that is from 1804 to 1811. And he began to write a series of imported essays. All his chief works were produced in the Turgau period, within which every detail of his new system was taking shape. Into these essays were instilled everything he had discovered in his restless wandering deriving from his provings, his thinking and his studies. His fragment of the Viribus presented the first published details of 27 provings, including Pulsatilla, Ignatia, Aconite, Drosera and Belladonna. Hahnemann's Fragmenta de Viribus Medicamentorum Positivis was published in Latin. This two-volume work gives us for the first time an insight into the remarkable and so far unknown methods of investigation which he employed. It supplies reports on the tests of 27 medicines, the results of years of experiment on himself and his family. From the considerations he had arrived at his wandering ears, Hahnemann had sought to develop a medical system that relied solely on single drugs in harmless doses and based upon pure observations, empiricism and experiment. He sought to do away with the blind chimney sweepers methods of dulling symptoms. Then so much in vogue. He fought with redoubled energy for the purity of medicine. He struck deadly blows at three points. First, he believed that the doctor should prepare his own medicines. Second, he advocated ever more definitely the administration of small doses. And third, he was the most passionate opponent of mixed doses that contained a large number of ingredients. Then came the medicine of experience in 1805, which was in every respect a forerunner of his organon. His other essays of 1805, 1808 and 1809 amount to magnificent critics of every mode of medical treatment and discussion of why similia and single drugs are superior and always have been. These were soon followed up with his Materia Medica Pura and Organon which proved to be great landmarks in the establishment of homeopathy. The organon of the art of healing is presented in sections after the manner of a legal court. 
its actions manifest the notable and intimidating terseness of legal paragraphs, which despite their unequivocal and final character can scarcely be understood without prolific commentaries. Likewise, his, his radical experiments with dose deduction commenced in 1798 and endlessly revised throughout his long life. The first decade of the 19th century saw an unprecedented outpouring of original texts as soon as his wandering had ceased. This veritable damn burst of literary activity was obviously preceded by two decades of study, experimentation and hard thinking. In 1806, his last translation from the Latin of Albrecht von Hallus Matria Medica signaled the end of the first phase of his life. The study of the views of others and the beginning of a new phase of being his own man and of formulating and defending his own views. Homeopathy, therefore, had a somewhat protracted birth emerging in pieces between 1790 and 1805. Homeopathy was slowly coming to birth. Of his stay in Torgau, it can be said that Hahnemann had through his detailed and exhaustive studies at last laid out a systematic and point by point demolition of every element in ancient and medieval medicine, leaving single drugs and similars as the only useful remnants. From these simple crumbs combined with his experiments, he was able to build the brilliant assays leading directly to the organon, which is his detailed exposition of the whole conceptual and practicing realm of homeopathy. Next, we'll talk about his stay in Lipchik. In 1812, Hahnemann moved back to Lipchik, the Saxon Athens, with new confidence and the chief intention of taking on the allopathic establishment. He was returning preeminently as a teacher to declare publicly what he had discovered. He obtained a teaching post on the faculty of the University Medical School after defending a thesis on Hellebore, which got its course of ancient works in most European languages. Such was the vast extent of Hahnemann's knowledge of the medical past and of languages. Quoting from more than 50 doctors, philosophers and naturalists, he was able to show his extraordinary knowledge of languages, to quote verbatim from manifold German, French, English, Italian, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and Arabic medical writers. Such a performance was hugely impressive to the academic present. Orthodox attacks upon him and upon homeopathy became increasingly coordinated, amounting to a vicious campaign of persecution, which soon reached such a pitch as to make his life in Lipchik almost intolerable. He was neglected and avoided by the students and was obliged to leave Lipchik because of this continuous antagonism of the medical profession and the governmental decree about self-dispensing of drugs which very effectively barred him from further legal medical practice. Though he had achieved a lot of leaving Lipchik, some might say Hahnemann felt himself to be almost excluded, once more result upon migration as the most dignified solution. Next, we'll talk about his stay in Koyten. It was by the end of 1820, he had therefore resolved to leave Lipchik. This was eventually achieved through protracted negotiations with the kindly Duke Ferdinand of Altona Koyten. Hahnemann finally obtained in April approval from the Duke for a position in Koyten and moved there in June 1821. This edict also allowed Hahnemann to do precisely what he had been denied in Lipchik, to prepare his own medicines. The comfort that must have brought would have seemed like a blessing from heaven. He remained in Koyten with his wife and daughters, Charlotte and Louisa, a splendid isolation for 14 years. Meanwhile, he continued to publish essays and books updating his Organon and Materia Medica Pura. His publication in 1828 of The Chronic Diseases opened up an entirely new chapter 
by exploring the underlying causes of disease as rooted solely in three ancient dyscrasias, skin diseases, which he used as sora, gonorrhea, psychosis, and syphilis. So, next I'll be talking about the second marriage of Dr. Christian Frederick Samuel Hahnemann. It was on 8th October 1834, four and a half years after the death of his wife, Johanna. A new lady entered his life, Melanie de Haveli Goyer, a young, attractive and well-connected French artist who paid him a surprise visit in Coetan. Over 40 years younger than him, she became first his patient, then his homeopathy student, and then she fell in love with him. They were married on 18th January 1835 in Coetan and moved to Paris on 7 June. Although Hahnemann had introduced the smelling of remedies or olfaction in 1832, but it was during this last phase of his long life that he established olfaction and the alum potencies as central pillars of his Paris practice. They are mentioned in detail in his final sixth organon, which however did not see the light of day until 1922. In old age, Hahnemann grew thinner and more dwarf-like. His knees bent in slightly. His torso was thrust forward, both when he walked and when he stood still. But the head which ever more and more dominated the body remained erect and sovereign. It was also in Paris where he made the last revision of the fifth organon in February 1842, though it was never sent to a publisher. It is also clear that his Paris years were filled with continuous experimentation, especially regarding dosage, potency, and mode of administering remedies. It was at this time that he devised the liquid doses and alum potency scale. So next it was the time when Hahnemann had to leave all of us. Hahnemann died in Paris of bronchitis. It was on 2nd July 1843, and he was buried first in Montmartre, but later reinterred in a more grandiose tomb paid for by the American subscription in the more prestigious Cimetière Paris Lecisi, where many famous people are buried. Example was Adith Paif and Chopin. Partly through attracting great controversy and partly through impressive clinical results, homeopathy spread rapidly in Europe, Russia, India, and America, where it always found the sympathy for the rich and titled as a safe alternative to bleeding and purging. So this was all about a brief biography of Hahnemann. So we understood that he was really a very laborious and a very hardworking man. Now let's talk about the achievements of Hahnemann. Samuel Christian Frederick Hahnemann, MD, was the first to scientifically establish and systematize the principle of curing by similars. Similia similibus curenture had been known throughout the history of medicine and was recognized by Hippocrates. By testing single drugs on reasonably healthy human subjects rather than animals or the sick, Hahnemann was able to determine their pure effects. All the others had suggested this and imperfect experiments were done to seek antidotes or immunity from poisons, Hahnemann was the first to methodically and precisely demonstrate a drug's ability to cause deviations from health. Thus, he may correctly be considered the father of experimental pharmacology. Prior to his enunciation of the simple principle, drugs had been given on speculative indications. These included the doctrine of signatures, effects on sick individuals, effects on animals, toxicological effects and botanical affinity. Or most often, the deciding factor was adherence to some established authority detailing formulae containing any number of drugs, many in massive toxic doses, purging and bloodletting prevailed until Hahnemann's condemnation and offering of a safer, more effective means of treatment. Hahnemann's contributions to chemistry and pharmacy are notable. His efforts in the period prior to his initiations of the similar principle in 1796 were to be vital 
to his development of a new system of pharmacy suited to the requirements of his practice. He introduced a new test for arsenic for use in toxicology and forensic medicine. His test for the detection of adulterations in wine was authoritative, as was his standardized pharmacy lexicon used in Germany for a good part of the 19th century. A preparation of soluble mercury still bears his name. Dr. Hahnemann introduced medicinal preparations of inert substances such as platinum and vegetable charcoal. Substances that were in his time generally considered inert such as gold, silica and the spores of lycopodium were reintroduced. The followers of Paracelsus had used silica. Arabian physicians utilized powdered gold and lycopodium had a history of use in folk medicine. But Hahnemann's method of preparation by trituration and subsequently potentization profoundly expanded their efficacy. So next uh, I like to come to the point of uh, Hahnemann's criticism of the practice of his time. So, so much for Hahnemann himself and how he came to discover and develop the homeopathic method of studying drugs for the sick. It may serve to give an idea of the state of medical practice as Hahnemann found it and at the same time to illustrate the courage and independence of the man if I refer in two pieces of public criticism written in the early part of his career. The one thing Hahnemann was blamed by his contemporaries more than anything else was his neglect of bloodletting that was Signer Pergere Clistrium Donner was the rule in Hahnemann's time and fool, criminal, murderer were the epithets applied to Hahnemann for his departure from the prevailing custom. Without shedding of blood, as it has been put, there was no salvation for patients in those days. However, that did not prevent Hahnemann from speaking his mind. The Emperor Leopold II died after repeated bloodletting on the 1st of March 1792. Commencing on the case, Hahnemann said, His physician, Legusius, observed high fever and swelling of the abdomen early on February 28th. He combined the malady by venesection and as this produced no amelioration. How could he order a third and good heavens? How a fourth where there had been no amelioration after the preceding ones? How could he tap the vital fluid four times in 24 hours, always without relief, from a debilitated man who had been worn out by anxiety of mind and long continued diarrhea. Another custom of the time against which Hahnemann ran a tilt was the prescribing of a variety of drugs in the same mixture. It was done quite artistically. There was a base called basis, a receiver called excipines, a corrective called corrigens, a helper called adjuvants, a director called dirigents and more besides. In every prescription and the larger it was, the more the prescriber was thought of by the apothecary at any rate, if not by the patient who had to swallow the dose. In 1797, the year following that in which his essay on a new principle was published, Hahnemann contributed another notable paper to Heuflin's journal entitled Are the Obstacles to Certainty and Simplicity in Practical Medicine Insurmountable? In this article, he delivers himself as follows in this practice. Who knows whether the adjuvants or the corrigents may not act as basis in the complex prescription or whether the excipients does not give an entirely different action of the whole. Does the chief ingredient, if it to be the right one, require an adjuvant? Does not the idea that it require assistance reflect severely on its suitability or should a dirigence also be necessary? The more complex our prescription are, the darker is the condition of therapeutics. How can we complain of the obscurity of our art when we ourselves render it to obscure and intricate? I will conclude this chapter 
by quoting some opinions of the man and his works expressed by eminent representatives of the opposite school. First, I will give the opinion of Hugh Flynn himself. Next, that of Sir John Forbes, editor of the Quarterly Medical Review. And lastly, of the eminent surgeon, Liston. The extracts are taken from Tract 7 of the Homeopathic League series. Hugh Flynn writes Dr. Dudgeon. Who knew Hanuman intimately, repeatedly expresses his opinion of his talents already in 1800? Hugh Flynn writes, This principle enunciated by Hanuman may doubtless serve to guide us to the discovery of useful remedies. Writing of homeopathy in 1826, he says, The subject becomes all the more important if the originator is a man who commands our respect. And no one will be able to deny that this is the case with Hanuman, and least of all one who is in the position of the author of this essay, whose acquaintance with Hanuman is of long standing, and who connected with him far more than 30 years by ties both friendships and of letters, valued him always as one of our most distinguished, intelligent and original physicians. Four years later, he writes, added to this was the respect I had long felt for the author, which was inspired by his early writings and the important services he had rendered to medicine. I had subsequently the opportunity of observing many instances of good results from the use of homeopathic medicines, which necessarily drew my attention to this subject and convinced me that it ought not to be contemptuously pushed on one side but deserves careful investigation, it is necessary to remind my readers that medicine has to thank Hanuman for the discovery of the wine test and of the soluble mercury, which is in my opinion still the most efficacious preparation of mercury as well as far so much else. He has given sufficient proof in many of his earlier writings of a grand philosophical acumen and of a great power of observation. Next, I would like to tell about uh, Sir John Forbes in his celebrated uh, critic of homeopathy says about the Hanuman in 1846. No careful observer of his actions or candid reader of his writings can hesitate for a moment to admit that he was a very extraordinary man, one whose name will descend to posterity as the exclusive excogitator and founder of an original system of medicine as ingenious as many that precede it, and destined probably to be the remote, if not the immediate, cause of more important fundamental changes in the practice of the healing art, than have resulted from any promulgated since the day of Galen himself. Hanuman was undoubtedly a man of genius and a scholar, a man of indefatigable industry and of undaunted energy. In the history of medicine, his name will appear in the name list with those of the greatest systematists and theorists, surpassed by few in the originality and ingenuity of his views, superior to most in having substantial and carried out his doctrines into actual and most extensive practice. By most medical men, it was taken for granted that the system is not only visionary in itself, but was the result of a mere fanciful hypothesis disconnected with facts of any kind and supported by no processes of ratiocination or logical inference, while its author and his apostles and successors were looked upon either as visionaries or quacks or both. And yet uh, nothing can be farther from the truth. Whoever examines the homeopathic doctrine as announced and expounded in the original writings of Hanuman and of many of his followers must admit not only that the system is an ingenious one, but that it professes to be complete code of doctrine with singular dexterity and much apparent fairness. Many among his followers are sincere, honest and learned men. It is interesting to remember, says Dajan that these merely polite and candid statements suspecting homeopathy and its practitioners proved fatal to the quarterly periodical which Forbes had conducted with eminent ability for more than 12 years, 
is subscribes would have nothing to do with the periodical which treated homeopathy with a semblance of fair play and which admitted that its practitioners might be sincere, honest and learned men. And so far lack of support, the medical review after lingering for another year was compelled to terminate the useful and honorable career. At last, uh, I would like to also add about what Professor Liston, who was the eminent surgeon, said in a lecture reported in, in The Lancet. After detailing the particulars of the cure of cases of erysipelas, which he had treated with homeopathic remedies, says, of course, we cannot pretend to say positively in what way this effect is produced, but it seems almost to act by magic. However, so long as we benefit our patients by the treatment we pursue, we have no right to condemn the principles upon which the treatment is recommended and pursued. You know that this medicine, belladonna, is recommended by homeopaths in erysipelas because it produces on the skin a fiery eruption or efflorescence accompanied by inflammatory fever. I believe in the homeopathic doctrine to a certain extent, but I cannot as yet from inexperience on the subject go to the length in its advocates would wish to so far as regards the very minute doses of some of the medicines. The medicines in the above cases were certainly given in much smaller doses that have hitherto ever been prescribed. The beneficial effects as you witnessed are unquestionable. I have however seen similar good effects of belladonna prepared according to the homeopathic pharmacopoeia in case of uh, very severe erysipelas and of the head and face under the care of my friend Dr. Quinn, the inflammatory symptoms and local signs disappear with very great rapidity. Without adopting the uh, theory of this medical sect, you ought not to reject its doctrine without close examination and inquiry. Thanks a lot, everyone, for listening. And uh, at last, I would like to conclude that with a brief biography of Samuel Hahnemann, which surely will serve a great role for understanding homeopathy. Because if you want to understand homeopathy, you must know about Dr. Samuel Christian Friedrich Hahnemann, who is the father of homeopathy. And also, I added the achievements of Hahnemann and the Hahnemann's criticism of the practice of his time. So I hope all of you enjoyed. Thanks a lot for listening.